Good morning, everyone. Welcome to episode nine of Paul's Letter to the Galatians. We are today going to be talking about uh, are you frustrating grace? That's, uh, that's a very really deep question, I think. I think that's something that we need to really look at and, and, and contemplate and really think about it. Am I frustrating grace? Because a lot of the things when we pray for things, when we ask God to do things for us, and you, know, you ever feel like your prayers are not answered and what's going on? Why am I still sick? Uh, why am I still struggling with these things? When you read the epistles and you see Jesus went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil, and then you look at your own life and you're saying, you know, well, how come I'm not sick? I mean, how, excuse me, how come I'm not well? Why am I still struggling with this? Why am I having a hard time maybe finding a job? Why am I struggling with my finances? And I believe the answer and the, the question that we need to be asking ourselves is this. Are you frustrating grace? Right? Are you frustrating grace? So, let's look at that. Let's look at the first verse. This is uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 17. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty. And I'm using the New Living Translation because... Um, it, it kind of really gives you kind of the spirit of what Paul was trying to say. I'll also interject with the New King James Version. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we, found, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean that Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. So he's making this statement because at this point in time, if you're just joining us for the first time, and we're looking at the... The, the church in Galatia, in Galatia, there had been Judaizers that came. Okay? These are Jewish Christians, well-meaning Christians, who were under the law, who got saved by grace, then all of a sudden began to be corrupted, that's the terminology I would use, corrupted by the law. In other words, feeling this sense of guilt that, you know, I'm not doing enough for God, right? And I'm sure as many of us well-meaning Christians if you have a tender heart for the Lord, you probably struggle with those things. Excuse me one second. I'm just going to get off camera and grab my water bottle. <laughs> okay, so it, it's those things where you begin to struggle with that thought. Am I being un, uh, unfaithful or ungracious to the Lord? Am I not following, uh, you know, doing all the things that I should be doing? You know, you start getting into this thing because you want to serve God. You want to be obedient to the Lord. You want to be faithful. And many of us were raised under a legalistic environment, a legalistic culture, right? So we, we get into this situation where all of a sudden we discover grace and find out that, guess what? Grace is a gift. I didn't do anything to earn it, and I can't do anything to lose it. But then there's this sense of, am I doing enough to warrant this grace, to have earned this grace? Then we go into this thing like, we want to please God. There's a genuine desire in our hearts to please God. But then, but then all of a sudden, self-effort starts to come in. We start to feel like we need to do more. I need to do this. I need to do that. Uh, you know, and it's very, very subtle. We start frustrating grace because grace is a gift. And we're going to get into how do you honor that grace that saved you later. So he's saying here, you know, am I being found guilty because I've abandoned the law? Right? Am I, am I now guilty because I'm not trying to work towards pleasing God? I'm not trying to earn God's favor. God's favor has already been given to me. And now, you know, am I now guilty? Right? So does that mean that Christ has led us to sin? Meaning sin, meaning me, sin, the mark, uh, uh, ab abdicating from the law. And he says, absolutely not. Then in verse 18, rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law, I already tore down. So what he's saying is this. Rather than feeling guilty about the fact that now salvation is free, my standing is free, my righteousness has been imputed to me, it's not anything I did, but it's what Christ did for me on the cross. He took my sin and his righteousness was imputed to me. The same way that when you were born into this world, you were conceived in iniquity and born in sin, the way David said. You did no sin, you knew no sin, you were a child, right? 
but you were born into a fallen state because since Adam, God has imputed sin to mankind so that when Jesus would come and die on that cross, righteousness could turn around and be imputed to you and he could do it justly. So the problem that we have and the guilt that we start feeling is because, wow, can this thing really be free, free? Like I'm, wow, really? I don't have to do anything. It's, it's a paradigm shift in our thinking that now I don't need to earn God's favor. I have God's favor through Jesus Christ. So all the doing falls upon God. Under the law, all the doing falls upon me to please him. But he's already pleased with me because I've accepted Jesus Christ, his son, as my Lord and Savior. I have been washed from my sins for all time, past, present, and future, wiped clean. Nothing Paul says in Romans can separate me from the love of God. I am saved to the uttermost, right? So now there's this sense, and this is what was happening in the Galatian church, where these Judaizers came in and these well-meaning uh, you know, Christians uh, wanted to please God. And so they find themselves going back under the law, which got Paul very upset. Because if there's one thing that grieves the Lord, it is us going back to the law, going back to self-effort, going back to having to try to work to try to please him. That is displeasing to God, right? Not that you accept his grace and you accept his love and that you stand and receive that love and allow Christ to live through you. That is pleasing to God. But when you try to earn something that God paid a high price to give you freely, so it didn't cost you anything. It cost Jesus everything, but it didn't cost you everything. That is, that's how you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, right? So he's saying, rather, I'm a sinner if I rebuild the old system of the law already tore down. So that means if I was saved by grace and I'm walking in grace, and then I try to go back to pleasing God under the remnants of the law, under the dictates of the law, under self-effort, where now I'm doing things to try to curry God's favor and earn God's favor. Now I'm a sinner. And I hate to say it, that's a large part of us. We've gone back. We were saved, everything was wonderful, and then all of a sudden the church comes and puts a yoke on us. you got to do more, be more, show up more, give more. And you feel compelled. Right? Listen, God doesn't want your money. But guess what? If you freely give your money out of a heart that's grateful for everything he's done for you, that is a gift that he receives. And God will then give you a thousandfold back in blessings here and in the hereafter. Then verse 19, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. Right? When I tried to do right, to be right, to abstain, it condemned me. The more sin conscious you are, the more you're going to sin. The more righteous conscious you are, the less you're going to stumble and fall and sin. Now, what do I mean by that? If you're trying so hard to abstain, right? Let's say you have an issue with your thought life, right? You're thinking uh, unclean thoughts, right? And you're trying so hard and you know, you're, yeah, I got to cast down imagination and you're working it, it's going to be worse. Rather, in Colossians 3, verse 1, set your thoughts on things above and not on things of the earth where Christ sits. So whatever situation you're going through, and it may be a difficult one, it may be a trying one, it may be a painful one, the solution is not to focus on your problem, but focus on the solution. Because I promise you that even if you're going through something painful and you feel like you're going to break, I've been there multiple times, you won't. God will give you the grace to sustain you. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul said, therefore, I will boast about my weakness, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Because God's strength can rest upon me. I can tell you personally that, you know, myself and my family, we're going through a lot right now. And we've been pushed to the breaking point, but we haven't broken yet. Because when we admit the weakness, his strength rests on us. All things work together for good to them who love God and those that are called according to his purposes. Romans 8.28. But we forget verse 8.29. For those whom he foreknew, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus suffered, we will suffer. We will go through difficulties. No servant is greater than his master, the scripture says. 
So the thing is to have joy. <laughs> I hate to say this, but to have joy in the suffering and in the difficulties. Why? Because you've been counted to suffer as Christ did. In the book of Acts, when they would be stripped, when they were beaten, uh, uh, and they went through the things, they went back and they rejoiced that they counted worthy to suffer as Christ suffered. Versus with us, when we go through difficulties, I know, I'm, I'm big on that, I start to complain, I start to whine, why me, why is this happening, I start getting upset. But I have to remind myself that my Lord went through far worse for me. So if He's allowing me to go through this difficult part, physical weakness, emotional weakness, mental weakness, whatever it is, and I feel like I'm about to break, I know that His strength is a reason, there's a purpose for it. Now, the thing is, is if you've been saved any length of time, you have to look back and see what God has brought you through. Unfortunately, many of us have been saved for a long time, but we really haven't gone through a great deal of difficulties. And so we find ourselves being weak and overwhelmed when things happened. But those of us who've been through a lot really don't have an excuse to be crying and whining and complaining because we know that God works everything for the good. And the goal of suffering and difficulties is to conform me to the image of Jesus. So I look at my attitude. What's my response to this situation and this circumstance that I find, currently find myself in? I start looking at my attitude. I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty bad. That's not good. And then if I try, you see, then you can't say, well, okay, then I'm going to try to change myself. No, it's an acknowledgement of, Lord, this is a weakness in my life. I have this attitude. So, Father, I surrender it to you. And you leave it there. And it's not going to stop. Listen, I'll freely admit right here to the whole world and the universe, the galaxy, and cosmos that I was a terrible driver. I drove like I was at Le Mans or the Indy 500 or the Daytona 500. Take your pick. And I was always I was in a hurry to get to where I was going and to get back from where I was coming from. And I didn't like people cutting me off and this and that. And I used to drive my poor wife, Pastor Sharon, crazy with that. But she did not want to be in the car with me. Now, I didn't know why I was doing that. And when I tried to change that behavior, it got worse. So you know what? I applied my own message to my own life. I said, Lord, I have a weakness in this area. I do not know why I do these things. But I yielded and surrendered to you. Did it go away right away? No, it didn't. But when I would fall, when I would have those moments, I'd be like, all right, take a deep breath, let it go. Don't get angry at the guy and keep going. And I would just continue upon my day. Then one day I woke up, I got in the car, and I started to drive, and I noticed that I was doing the speed limit. <laughs> and I couldn't tell you what happened, maybe while I was asleep. The Lord took my brain out and took all that stuff out and put it back in the right way. I don't know what he did. But the fact of the matter is, that was several weeks ago, and to this day, I don't drive like a maniac anymore. I drive the speed limit, whether I'm in local roads or I'm on the highway or whatever. I am more calm. If there's delays, it's because God has allowed the traffic jam, has allowed the delay. There's a purpose and there's a plan behind it. I don't need to understand it. I don't need to make sense of it. I just need to yield to it. And that is the hardest part. I'm going to tell you, this is not easy. You know what? But I am a veteran of these wars that I have fought in this temple to give the reins of my life to my Lord Jesus Christ. And any progress that I have made over the last, it's been a while, 47, 48 years, 48 years, 49 years, okay, of being in the Lord has been learning from my mistakes and learning that the next time I find myself in that situation, yielding to it. The Lord once said to me, don't fight the process be transformed by the process. Our problem is, is that when we go through difficulties, we fight it. We want it to go away. Lord, get rid of this thing. You know, it's been cloudy, it's been rainy, it's been stormy. I want to see the sun, Lord. I haven't seen the sun in a long time. But, for me, I yield to it. I know the sun's going to come out eventually. But I say, Lord, give me the strength to bear up in the storm, in the wind, in the hail. And as the rain batters my face and my sails are torn, I keep my eyes up because I know he's, in, he's with me in that boat that I'm in. He's, he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. 
But you know what? In those moments, that gets put to the test. Do you really believe that? Because whatever you believe, you, it's going to be put to the test. You can say whatever you want, but how you live your life, what comes out of your mouth, and what dominates your thoughts is going to be the litmus test of what you truly believe. I'm telling you right now, that's the reality. Like my wonderful wife once said to me, don't tell me, show me. Don't tell me what the Lord said to you. Show me what the Lord said to you. Let's see it change. <clears throat> because we're not islands unto ourselves. Whatever I do affects my wife. And whatever she does affects me. And as a church, whatever I'm struggling or dealing with affects the people who are looking to me for spiritual leadership. So we got to get this right. And I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody, but I'm just trying to tell you that there are things that we will do <clears throat> that will frustrate grace. Right? Because he says, when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. The law is not there to make you righteous. It's there to point out to you your need for a savior. The law is like the, the teacher, the student, the, 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 the taskmaster <clears throat> that shows you, wow, I can't do this. I need grace. And grace is a person. Jesus Christ. So, he said, I tried to stop meeting its requirements. I tried to stop pleasing God by what I do so that I can live for Him. And letting the life that He gave me as a gift blossom as a flower in my life. So let's continue. Now this is Galatians 2.20, famous verse. Everybody loves it, quotes it. Ad nauseum. But the living translation says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Right? Your old self is dead. Whoever you once were when you came to Jesus, that person is dead. New spirit, same old body. Right? And that body has desires and lusts. Right? That can be conquered when Christ lives his life through you. When you let Christ live his life through you. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The King's James, and I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, for Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. It's not his faith. Paul is saying, I don't live my life by my faith. I live my life by his faith. <clears throat> it's his obedience, right? We talk about all these things and spiritual warfare, and I do believe in spiritual warfare, but I think the church has kind of gotten a little warped with the whole concept of spiritual warfare. Because Paul said, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Not through you, not through me, not through our self-effort, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Then what are the strongholds? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against our knowledge of God. The strongholds in our lives start in the mind. If you think you're sick, I promise you, you will be sick. If you think you won't get well, I promise you, you won't get well. According to your faith, be it unto you. You know how many times Jesus said that in the epistles, in the, in the, uh, in the gospels? It's your trust. It's your belief system. It's what's up here that determines what happens out here. Right? So we cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against our knowledge of God. Here's the issue that if you've been following this ministry for any length of time, you know. If your belief system in God is here, it doesn't take much for the enemy to overcome that. But if your belief system in God is up here, it's going to take a lot for him to climb those walls. And that's what's going to keep you safe is trusting God. No matter what you're going through, I promise you, if you yield to the Lord, if you let His strength flow through you, if you look to His strength to cover that area of weakness, you will overcome. You will go from victory to victory and glory to glory. I promise you because I know. I just, I don't not just know <clears throat> from a scriptural standpoint. I know experientially, every time I was in a difficult situation when I was going to break and I yielded to the Lord, God always gave me the strength to bear it. What I have discovered in my life is God will either deliver me out of a trial, He'll deliver me from a trial, or most times He'll deliver me through a trial. And the purpose, if I'm going through something, notice 
through. So that's not my permanent zip code. I'm just going through something. The purpose is to conform me to the image of Jesus through suffering. I wish I could sit here and tell you that there's a better way to be like the Lord, but there really isn't. Difficulties and trials and tribulations and storms is how we get molded into the image of Jesus. You know what? Any concept or any illusion that you were given when you came into the kingdom as that this was going to be gumdrops and lollipops and tiptoeing to the tulips, tulips is not scripturally sound. It is not. I don't have the time, so I only have less than 10 minutes left in my broadcast. But I will tell you that is not scripturally sound. But I will tell you that I am a very happy person in spite of my trials, my tribulations, and my storms. Because every time I went through some difficulty, it gave me a deeper appreciation of what Jesus did for me on that cross. And I know that if I stay faithful to the Lord, and I yield to the Lord, and Christ is allowed to live His life through me, when I stand in His presence, I will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. And I will receive reward in His presence. But I'll receive reward here too. But my eyes are up. Set your thoughts on things above and not on things of the earth where Christ sits. Colossians 3, 1. And, because, and verse 2. Because you are dead and your life is hidden in Christ. Your true life is hidden in Christ. And no matter what you try to do in the natural until you yield to the Lord and embrace your storm and embrace your trials and yield your weaknesses, you will not discover the life that Christ died to give you on that cross. You will not experience lasting freedom and healing from the things that, that, that ache you and plague you. I promise you, God is not a liar. He is not a liar. It is written by His stripes, we were healed. So if healing is not breaking forth in our body, then something is stopping it. And what did we say about strongholds? They're up here. This is where the enemy is. This thing of binding principalities and all this other stuff. I don't see that in Scripture. But I do see that i got to cast down imagination. I do see that the strongholds can be built in my mind. And once they're in there, they're going to affect everything else out here. It's super important, super important to do that. And then verse 21, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. In other words, what Christ, I appreciate what Christ did for me on the cross. I appreciate it. Yo lo aprecio, like we say in Spanish. It's, it's something deep. It's like a treasure. And, and, and I guard it because I understand what Christ did for me on that cross. For keeping the law, if, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. If your self-effort would have been enough to satisfy and please a holy God, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to die. But the fact of the matter is that it wasn't. And this is very important for you and I to keep in mind, that no amount of self-effort is going to please God. None of it. It's not. But when you live a life that honors the blood that was shed on that cross for you, right? I'm pointing because we have a cross over here. <laughs> then you honor that. You live your life in honoring to that. Even when you're going through difficulties, you say, Lord, you went through far more for me. Give me the strength and the grace to bear up through these trials. I yield to you, Lord, that you give me the strength that whatever gets thrown my way, I'm not facing it alone. Because that's how the enemy gets us. The enemy gets us to isolate ourselves and withdraw from others and would mentally withdraw from God by saying, I'm the only one going through this. You don't understand. I don't need to understand, but you need to yield. The issue is not a question of understanding. The issue is a question of yielding. You don't have to understand what you're going through, but you need to yield to that storm and say, Lord, I yield to you. I can't tell you how many times I've gone through stuff where even Pastor Sharon didn't know, and I was in that car crying and weeping and wailing that I had to pull over when I was in the highway. And I told the Lord, and I looked back. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. And I pulled over and I said, Lord, I don't understand this and I'm scared. But I know you love me and you died on that cross to give me life. And I yield to you in this moment, in this storm. I don't know what's coming and what's ahead or how we're going to get through this. But I yield to you. Man, and he showed up every single time. That's why I can stand up here and tell you this. My life has not been sailing through. 
I have been a soldier in this battle since I was seven years old. And then I was a soldier in the United States Army. I know what it means to follow orders and I know hardships and difficulties. But I'm here to tell you, spiritually speaking, I have a Lord who loves me. A big brother and his name is Jesus. And I have a father who I call Abba, who's my daddy, who has never left me, has never forsaken me, has kept me from hurt, harm, and danger. Because I have a plan, he has a plan and a purpose. And I will fulfill my purposes for which I was put in this world because I yield to my Lord every single day. And sometimes that's very hard to do. But we have to do it. And we have to do it joyfully. Because God takes pleasure when he sees us going through difficulties and trials and tribulations with joy. Saying, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. You know, you guys have been seeing this for a while. The mind is everything. What you think you become. Proverbs 4.23, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. This is going to be up here during the whole time that we do this series. Because your mind is the key to your victory. Jesus already defeated the enemy on the cross. All things have been given to us pertaining to life and godliness, Peter said. Life, bios, your physical body, and godliness, being like Jesus. All we have to do is lay hold of it and embrace it. But are we embracing it? You, are the only, you and I are the only ones that know. Because it's great to be a Christian when you're in church and you're singing songs and the message is good and amen and hallelujah. But when you hit that parking lot is when reality comes in. When Monday comes around, that's when reality comes in. If you have sick parents that you're taking care of, that's where reality hits. That's where you need Jesus. When you have to sit there and you only have a certain amount of money to pay your bills and they don't add up, that's when you need Jesus. And Pastor Sharon and I have been there through everything, through all of it, and we're still standing by His grace. By the grace of God, we are standing and when you don't, you can lead other people astray when your mind and your thoughts are not where they need to be, especially if you are a leader. Look at this verse. For by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is not about what you do to please God. This is not about what, oh, this is what I can do or what I'm going to do for the Lord. I'm going to give all this money or my time. No, no. He wants you. And you belong to him. So now as we get ready to close, Christ revealed in me. You have to ask yourself, how much of Jesus is being revealed in me? How much of my life is a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is, would he handle this situation that I just handled in the manner that I just handled it? Would he respond to this particular situation the way I just responded? Or would he be far more gracious and patient? That's a deep question. And that's a question that each of us have to ask ourselves. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead resides inside of us. In, in Ephesians it says, He who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us. You've got to unleash that lion inside of you. You've got to let the Lord be the Lord in your life and yield your life to Him. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. Never be the same again. Until we meet again, my friends, God bless you.